Hello everyone, hope you are all doing fantastically great. I'm really, really, really thrilled today because, well, I don't have to introduce this guy that is just beside me here on the screen. You all know him, you all love him as well. Uh, I mean, he taught us a lot from, from these past years, how to, how to better create a UX strategy, how to work with UX metrics, how to use the Kano model, uh, the categories of, of, experience, of experience, like from, from frustrating experience to delightful, passing through invisible experience. I mean, we all learned a lot with him and now we have the chance and the opportunity to have him here and I'm not gonna waste any more second. Please meet Jared Spool. Thank you so much for being here, Jared. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Awesome. Yeah, everybody. That's really good. Uh, well, today we're going to talk about UX strategy and um, how us as UX leaders or even junior UX that might be watching uh, on the invitation, I specifically told if you want to invite your boss, please invite your, bo your boss. It will help us as well. So anyone that has some question, please just share the questions in the chat. I'm going to be reading the questions to, to Jared so he can answer it. Um, and also, I have a few questions of my own, if you allow me. Uh, <laughs> and You're paying for it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think we could start from the basics, right? Because um, we have tons of people here that are starting UX, that are just starting this, this, challenging, this challenge on, of, of shaping the UX culture or the design culture in, the, in their company, in their organization. And I mean, the first question that uh, Stones of them sent me and I'd like to, 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 to pose it to you right now is, what the heck is UX strategy? Good question. I, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, is, uh, uh, is, is just a, another strategy that a business has to succeed, right? So... We can, we can divide a business up by its uh, departments, right? We can say, well, there's a sales department and a marketing department, a finance department, support, you know, there's some sort of engineering or IT and, you know, somewhere in there is UX, right? And um, uh, each of those groups, has a strategy, right? Sales has a strategy to sell products to help the organization do what it needs to do. And marketing has a strategy to market the products and services and make people aware of them and get new leads and whatever that is. And finance has a strategy to uh, make sure that the amount of money coming in is, is more than the amount of money going out and that, that uh, uh, they're, they're able to track that money and do the best things they can with it. And, Support has a strategy to make sure that every customer is successful and that everyone is good. So all there are all these strategies in the organization at any given time. And UX strategy is just another strategy. And the sales strategy is, well, how, do the, how does the sales group use all of the expertise and knowledge and resources and people and capabilities that they have for sales to help the organization succeed? And the finance group is how do they use all their expertise and knowledge and capabilities and resources to make things succeed? So the UX strategy is how do we use all the UX things to that we know, all the resources, capability, knowledge, people that we have, how do we use that to the fullest to be able to help the organization succeed? And so depending on what the organization is trying to do, we will have different UX strategies. And so... So the UX strategy is just that. It's, it's just, a, it's just a, a high level plan of how we're going to help the organization succeed by using everything we can that has to do with delivering great user experiences. Does that make sense? Totally, completely sense. So this is really interesting because when, when we were talking about, uh, basically we were talking about putting the, 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 the UX um, needs, I don't know if that's the best word, or the UX principles mostly, in order to help to push whatever is important for the company on the reality on their given time frame. For so is that basically it? 
Yeah. So, so if the organization is, is, um, uh, an airline, it, the UX strategy is, well, how do we deliver the best experiences for our customers, for our employees, for, um, uh, uh, all the, the, the people who we work with, how do, you know, the people who buy and sell cargo, you know, how do we create great experiences for all those people? If we are, um, uh, a chain of retailers, how do we deliver the best experiences for, uh, the, the people who buy our products, the people who sell us our products, who we then sell to our customers for our own employees. Right. So it's, it's always about the experiences. But once you get into what the business does, the strategy is going to be very different. And it's going to be very different depending on where the business is and what it knows about UX and, and pretty much anything else. So, so every UX strategy is unique to the current time and place of that business. Awesome. And <clears throat> it's, it's interesting because usually we, we get to see uh, people thinking of UX as just the design part, as just the digital part. And uh, uh, when I, 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 I see companies talking about, hey, we need to put a little bit of UX in this part of our product. Uh, can you do it to make it more beautiful? But you should do it fast because we just have one sprint and uh, we should do it faster so that the developers won't lose their time uh, or wanna, won't wait for you while you're doing so. And this shows us that, okay, there's a problem. Maybe I should do something here. And what, what are your, 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 your uh, tips actually for the ones that are leaving this, uh, this uh, dilemma right now in their companies? Um, well, the place that I always start when we want to think more strategically, because what you're describing is basically thinking in a sort of reactive tactical way, strategy has to be proactive. We have to get in front of the problem. We have to ask ourselves, not just how do we make these things that we're building better, but we have to ask ourselves, how do we make, uh, how do we decide what the, a better experience is and then build things to support that, right? And so, um, so when we're trying to get more proactive and we're moving from designing the thing right to designing the right thing, um, we're, what we need to do is we need to understand, well, are we even on the same page as to what we're trying to do? So the place that I always start is, uh, with what we call a UX outcome and a UX outcome is, Uh, a change in the world. An outcome is a change in the world. Uh, uh, if you talked to Jeff Godelf last week, he probably talked to you about the difference between outcomes and outputs. And outputs are things we deliver, right? A product is an output. A new report is an output. These are, these are things that we, we deliver. Um, and just putting it out is success. Uh, but it doesn't say whether we put the right thing out or we put something that was good out. It just says, hey, we got it out. That's what outputs are. Outcomes are changes. And when we look for changes, we can say, okay, well, what kind of change do we want? And so a UX outcome has to do with the user experience. So it basically asks a question. It says, well, if we work really hard and do a great job on this thing that we're building, how does that make someone's life happier, right? How does that make someone's life better? So we want to talk about the change, that's the outcome part, as it pertains to a user experience. So how does it make the, uh, someone's, an improvement in someone's life? And that's the place to start. If we're ever confused about something, we say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm working on this mouse, right? I'm working really hard. You're asking me to do things. I'm going to make it wider. I'm going to make it smaller. I'm going to make it faster or whatever it is, right? Use less battery. How does that make someone's life better? Let's talk about how each of those things make someone's life better. If we can't come up with a question, why are we, or an answer to that question, why are we doing this? Right? Why am I working on that thing? 
if we don't know how it's going to make someone's life better because that's just an output exactly i want to know what the outcome is exactly and and if we can get agreement on that and usually i don't care what the answer is as long as it's something well you know i want this better so more people can afford it okay so that means i need to make it more affordable i understand that or i want this better because i want people to walk in the, i want guests when they walk into my office to go oh my gosh you have that like okay now i need to make it look attractive and jump off the table right you know what is it i need to know what it is and i as a designer i usually don't care what the answer is i just need to know what the answer is and when we get into trouble it's because we haven't had a conversation about what the answer is but once we know the answer it's like yeah okay i'm there i can do that Awesome. And, and as, as a designer, how, how do you think, uh, because usually as designers, we are uh, kind of waiting uh, for, for this kind of answers. And sometimes we are asking and a few times the, the, uh, the leaders or the product owners or the CEOs or whatever, the, the, the higher point on the, on the strategy, the upstream, they say, uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Um, then the design says, well, let's figure it out together, right? And do you have some mm -hmm. tips on, on that? How, how, how they can help these people to start to see it? Is there, a, I don't know, a, a kind of workshop? Well, we can do? yeah, the, the easiest tip is to just pick something. Because if, if you pick something and they don't like it, they'll say, well, that's not it. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, then what is it? It's obviously not what I pick. What is it? You know? Uh, almost always the way to get the right answer is to tell them what the wrong answer is. And then they'll go, no, no, that's not the right answer. <laughs> like, oh, okay, tell me what the right answer is. Uh, um, so that's one trick. But there, there are lots of ways we can have this conversation. We can, we, can, we can go meet people. We can say, well, let's go meet our customers and find out where they're currently not happy. And we'll figure out how to make their lives better. So we can that way. We can... Uh, uh, pay attention to the marketplace. I mean, there's there's any number of things. We can look and see what people are complaining about in support. Uh, we can talk to our salespeople, find out what's causing them to lose sales. It, it it's, it's not rocket science. And we know this because NASA is one of our clients and they have very strict rules as to what is rocket science. And they've told us this is definitely not rocket science. <laughs> Fully agree with that. And what I, what I love when we were talking about outcomes is that, that they are, 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 are measurable changes that we see on behaviors, right? And mm -hmm. there's a really great, great question here from Bruno. Uh, how? Bruno. Yeah, Bruno Cambraia, Hello, Bruno. also from Brazil. We have people from France here watching. So, Olá, Bruno. Olá, Bruno. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And his question is, in that case... Do you think a designer should focus on KPIs and business metrics? Um, I think the designer should focus on business outcomes. All a KPI is, is an important metric, right? So, you know, should you focus on an important metric? Well, it's important. If it's important, you should focus on it. Uh, uh, it's better than, than focusing on unimportant metrics. Um, Uh, 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 whether you focus on business metrics or not depends on whether your outcomes need those business metrics to succeed. Uh, so, for example, if your product doesn't sell, it's not going to help any business metrics. Right. So if you build this expensive, fantastic thing, but nobody buys it, that doesn't help anybody. So at some level, we have to pay attention to the business outcomes. But the business outcomes, right, if we ask the question, if we do a great job on this thing, how do we make someone's life better? Well, if they don't buy the thing, we can't make their life better. So we have to get it, we have to get them to buy it in order for their life to be improved. So that's a requirement of the process. So we have to understand that that exists. And, you know, if I'm making 
uh, an online streaming platform and nobody subscribes to it, how is this platform making anybody's life better? So I have to figure out how I'm going to get people to subscribe and then stay subscribers. And so are those business important business measures? Absolutely. Those are outcomes. Those are business outcomes that are important. But we start with the user experience outcome first. If we start with the business outcome first, you know, let's increase adoption by 5%, then we are very tempted to go down the road of things like dark patterns that trick people into signing up that don't actually want the service and don't benefit from it, right? So, so we, if we start with the UX outcome and we say, okay, well, if we do a good job on this streaming video service, how is that making someone's life better? Well, they can watch all the TV shows from their childhood and show them to their kids and, and all these things. Okay, that's great. We, let's go find people who want to show these things to their kids and let's find out what they need for that to happen. And then we figure out from there, well, what is this subscription system going to have to have to get people to be able to do that? And we build the subscription system that gets them to that happier outcome. That's how this works. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thinking, uh, we have a bunch of questions here, but, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to link it with one question that I had uh, while hearing you. Uh, it came up because <clears throat> today in companies we have, well, everybody knows that we have silos, right? So this is not news for anyone. Uh, everybody also knows that this break the silos stuff is kind of difficult and how, how can we like connect the silos that we can make the silos work towards a common outcome or, or, or something related to that. But the question is because everybody has its own agenda and how to make sure the, the UX agenda or the UX strategy is being, um, uh, is being, it has a seat at the table. Well, first, um, there is no table. <laughs> As everybody says there's, we have to get a seat at the table, but anybody who, who works in senior management will tell you there is no table. There, there, there's, if you get a seat at the table, all that means is that you are now in another meeting. That's, that's all. Uh, 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 the, the, there is nothing there. But what people mean when they get, say, get a seat at the table is that they want to they have proactive input into the decisions before they lock down constraints that make it harder to do our work, right? That's what they mean when they say, I want to see at the table. And there's, that's way more complicated than just pulling up a chair at a table. It's, uh, um, it means that you, you first, you mentioned multiple agendas, right? And That's really important because people do have multiple agendas. And how are those agendas set? And who decided what the order of things on those agendas are, what the top priority of the agenda is and what the lower priorities are? And what work have you done to understand those other agendas? So this is a research task, right? And this is an important part of, of UX research is to research amongst the people you work with to find out what are all the different agendas that are out there. And if you adopt a role of, of what we call servant leadership, the first thing you do is you say, well, okay, your agenda is important to you. How can I help you with it? So if there's another group in the organization and they have an agenda, I want to know what their agenda is. And then I want to know how I can help their agenda. The more I can help their agenda, the more they're going to help me with my agenda, especially if our agendas are aligned. And so if our agendas match up, then my helping them helps me. It's a very destructivist view of the world, but it's, it's this, this notion of um, if I am doing, uh, uh, if I am helping them with something that's important to them, I get the space to do the things that are important to me too, assuming there's an alignment there. And so we have to start with that. But one of the things we have to understand is, well, how do agendas get set? And they almost always get set through some sort of 
reward system that exists in the organization. People are being either explicitly rewarded, they're given bonuses to do things, or they're implicitly rewarded. They're, they're um, uh, you know, people who ship products get promoted faster. And so we need to understand what those rewards are. And we need to ask questions like, is shipping the product the most important thing? Or do we need to shift the relation, the reward to no longer reward just getting something out the door, but instead to reward getting something that improves people's lives getting out the door? And how would we start to measure that? And so part of our strategy might be to understand the reward systems and try to change them in such a way that people are incentivized to deliver high quality products, not just deliver something. And because if someone's heavily rewarded for delivering something and you don't change the reward, there's no way you're gonna get them to stop delivering something. And if what you're trying to do will slow them down or prevent them from delivering, they're not going to be interested in your agenda at all because they're not going to get their reward. That's so, so we need to understand the rewards and we need to get to the source of the reward problem. And it's often not the person who is being rewarded that gets to pick what the reward is. There's an expression we use here that says climb the river, right? Because that's exactly what you're saying. And what I love about it is that... Climb the river? I don't know. It's weird. But in Portuguese... It, it is weird. In Portuguese, it makes more sense, I assure you. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, or not. But uh, meaning Does that... Does it mean go upstream? Exactly. Go upstream. Um, okay. Uh, we say in Portuguese, we say subir o rio. But it's the same thing. There's no, no concrete sense on that. But uh, yeah, go okay. upstream. And uh, oh, extreme makes sense to me. Okay, exactly. Climb the river. Okay, I get that. I get that. Exactly. Yeah, the Portuguese are, you know, and the and the Brazilians are not as crazy as everybody wants to make them out to be. I'm just going to put that out there. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> I mean, there's kind of all, but everything else is 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 <laughs> exactly. But I, what I really love about that is that. Actually, you're using our skills of uh, the, the empathy that we have to put to find out good uh, interactions or, or good experience for the customers and how we can use that inside the organization in order to uh, get our uh, agenda between quotes uh, understood. Right. But there's a delay of time on that, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, you, you need to... Strategy is a long-term game, right? UX strategy does not happen quickly. It does not happen um, uh, uh, in a week or in a sprint. UX strategy is something that takes months, years to execute. And, it, and it's, it's slow change over long periods of time. And so you have to be working the long game. If you are just in it for the next few weeks, if you're just in it for the next month, if you're just in it for this project, you can't do strategy. So, so everything takes time. Yeah, fully agree with that. Fully agree with that. I, I'm going to take uh, questions from the audience because uh, we are more than, than 100 people right now watching. Uh, and I'm going to start with... Oh, wow. Yeah. There's a lot of you. Lots of us. <laughs> and so Camila is asking... Uh, oh, Camila. Hi, Camila. Also resilient. I think there are a few French people asking as well. Um, every every single French that I talked today, they talked to me about the 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 um, conference about Keno model that you gave in Paris a few years years ago. It's a huge. Hit oh wow, YouTube that was well. a long time ago. Yeah, five yeah. years ago, and they still remember. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So Camila asked uh, Jared, could could you comment on your latest tweet about dashboards? It was so interesting and led to a really rich discussion mm. in the thread. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so, <laughs> and the, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready for bed and I'm just thinking about things and I come upon somebody asking, Hey, 
what's what are your best tips for dashboards? And the first thought that comes to my mind is, don't build them, right? <laughs> that, yeah, just 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 run away. Um, uh, or more importantly, finish the work. Uh, dashboards are what we do uh, when we don't know what people want to do with the data. It's like, well, we don't know what they do, so we're just going to create a, a graphic and put it all up on the wall, and they'll figure out what they want to do with the data. And it's it's um, it's just a messy, messy way to do design. And uh, almost always, uh, you know, customers ask for dashboards because they don't know what they want to do with the data. And, uh, and then we go and build them, but that's the wrong answer, right? The answer is, well, let's figure out what you're going to do with the data. Now, uh, you might consider a bigger strategy, which says, well, we're going to build a dashboard just so we can see what you do with the data. But you have to be ready to deal with the fact that 80 or 90% of the things you put into the dashboard are not useful. And that you're only going to, you need to identify what that 10% is. And that's an inefficient process to discover what users need. And so what you really need to do is you need to understand what people are going to do with this information. And if you understand what they're going to do with the information, chances are just showing it to them when they happen to glance at the dashboard is not the right solution. That there's something else that needs to happen, that this information is necessary to support decisions and you need to build some type of decision support. And that's, um, uh, uh, that's, that's the, the very short. So I, I, I write this thing before I go to bed and I wake up the next morning and it has a thousand likes and I'm like, <laughs> really, that's what you're interested in. I tweet things all the time and you know, they get 10 likes, 20 likes. And, and this is the thing we're going to talk about is dashboards. I actually had to turn off Twitter for the day because I had to get work done. I couldn't deal with explaining to people that dashboards are a bad idea over and over and over again. Cool. So I'm not going to waste your time on talking more about that here. I'm going to jump for the next question that we have <laughs> from, uh, from Fernando Lins, um, who's asking, Jared, could you walk us through a typical week in a planning process? products strategy, where do you start? Oh, sorry, a typical week in planning a product strategy. Where do you start? Um, well, I guess it depends on what you mean by a product strategy. Uh, if you mean a product strategy as in there's a group of people who call themselves product and they're going to use all the resources they can to figure out how to help the company. That's going to take more than a week. If you mean by a product strategy, we're going to roll out this product with this set of features and then follow it with this product with this set of features and then follow it with this product, with this set of features. That's a different type of thing. And so, um, because that's not using all the capabilities of the product team to help the organization. That's just deciding on the order of things. Um, so if we want to decide on the order of things that that's, that's a, that's a more sort of straightforward thing. There's, there are formulas for that. For example, uh, Bruce McCarthy has a formula, uh, uh, that's basically you take the, uh, value of the thing, you divide it by the effort of the thing, you multiply both those things by the confidence you have that you have either of the, that you understand that the value is correct and the effort is correct. And it gives you some sort of number. And if you use the same units for all the different ideas that you have for what could go into this product or what the products could be, uh, the higher numbers will tell you which things you should ship first. Those are the things with the most value and the least effort that you have the most confidence in. And so um, 
that's a product strategy if you think of product strategy as deciding what goes into the product. But if you think of product strategy as we've got all these people who are working on the product and they have all this knowledge, and they have all this expertise, uh, and we have all these resources and we have all these techniques and tools and things, the product strategy is going to be, well, what's the company trying to do and how can we use all those things to get that strategy? And so this is the problem with these words is that I, I never know what people are talking about when they say a product strategy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> free dance and free, exactly that's 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 meaningful and i mean uh, i i like one one answer you gave once that is uh what's the problem what is what is the problem you were trying to solve yeah i mean yeah yeah so so i mean here let me let me show you something uh give me one sec to get set up even two here talk amongst yourselves Uh, I'll give you a question to discuss amongst yourselves. The Prince of Tides is neither about princes or tides. Discuss. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. There are also not grape nuts. There's no grapes or nuts in grape nut cereal. We can discuss that too. Uh, I don't know why. Okay. So let's see if this will work. Okay. Ah, uh, fancy. Yes, yes. Fancy. Nice hands, by the way. Oh, thank you. I, <laughs> I use palm olive. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we have our UX outcome, right? Yeah. So, so, whoops, I need to, to hold on. Yeah, it's a, a little bit I, out of focus. I'm feeling a little out of focus today. No worries. We are I'm, on. I'm, I, I need to focus better. And then, right? Go. There you go. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Okay. So, if you could read my handwriting. Yeah, perfect. That says, in English, UX outcome, right? So, this is some sort of, of improvement for someone. Okay. So we're improving someone's life. Who are we improving? Well, it could be a customer or user. It could be a um, uh, uh, someone who is uh, uh, a employee. It could be any number of folks. Um, but somehow we're going to uh, improve their life. Now, uh, uh, and we also have our current product uh, uh, or service, whatever we do for a living. Right. And it's got it. We can measure this product or service on a scale of uh, uh, that goes from uh, frustration all the way up to delight, right? And the only reason we're thinking about this product or service is because right now it's more frustrating than it's delightful. If it was completely delightful, we wouldn't be touching it. We'd leave it alone. So, so and here we have our UX outcome. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get somehow from here to there, right? We're trying to get to this improvement in people's lives by going over the, the service that they have. Now, where a lot of teams start is they come up with ideas, right? And they say, oh, we could do this, we could do that, right? And, and the ideas are almost always solutions. And so what we're doing with those, those solutions is we're basically asking the question, you know, uh, 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 if we change the product, can we improve someone's life, right? But these, in essence, are all guesses. We don't know if that's going to actually work to improve someone's life or not. Um, 
we don't know if if this solution is is the solution that we need it to be. So uh, instead, what we need to focus on here is uh, the problems that need solving. And these are the things that are causing the frustration in the user's life. And then once we know what the problems are, it's way easier to figure out what the solution should be. So we basically nuke that connection and we say, okay, we really have to understand the problems first. If we understand the problems that we're trying to solve, then we can get to solutions that solve those problems, then we improve somebody's life. And uh, that's, that's the pattern. So we have, we, a great designer falls in love with the problems. They don't fall in love with the solution. They really don't care about the solution. They're, they're, the solution is, is very ambiguous to them. What they're mostly interested in is the problem. Yeah. If you can solve the problem, you will you will be much more likely to succeed. Does that make sense? Completely. And I'd like to add on your drawing because what I what I, what I really like about it is um, the, the the metrics because when once you solve and you understand actually the problem you have you can start to understand how are you going to measure that you are solving this problem. And this may help you to assess your ideas, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so, so next week we're running... Ah, I'd like you to talk our, about that. Yeah, yeah, we're running one of our intensives. And what that is, is um, we are... Um, uh, we're, we're spending an entire week talking about pers persuasive UX metrics. And what persuasive UX metrics are is we start with the outcome. And we say, for the outcome, what does success look like, right? Remember, the outcome is a change in the world. So yep. the, the, the change has to be observable. If we are making an improvement in someone's life, how would we tell that we've made an improvement in someone's life? So we start by just saying, well, what is that observable change? It may be something that's easy to measure. It may be something that's hard to measure. We're not going to pay attention to that detail at first. We're going to just ask the question, how would we tell? How would we tell that we've made someone's life better? So if we are creating a system that is used, let's say it's used for, for uh, hospitals, doctors and nurses use this system to increase the quality of patient care. What does that increased patient care look like? Is it uh, they get out of the hospital faster? Is it that they are generally healthier, that they are treated faster, that they can handle more patients? Um, you know, let's talk about what those are, that the outcomes for the patients, like they leave walking out healthy instead of being pulled out in a gurney, right? What does it look like when they leave? So that's success. So we start there and we ask the question, what does success look like for that, for that process? And then we can ask ourselves a bunch of questions, right? We can ask ourselves, uh, how will we tell that we are making improvements, right? So if we, if we say, okay, Right now, on our scale of, of frustration to delight, um, uh, we are, if this is the scale, we are currently here. What does it look like if we're there? What does it look like if we're there? What does it look like as we weigh up the scale? So that's what we're doing. And we're, we can then say, okay, well, maybe that's a series of solution changes that we do, or maybe it's getting adoption, or maybe it's increasing retention. It's not clear, but, but we need to know what, those, what that scale is. And those become our progress metrics. Yes. And then 
there's another set of metrics here that we can look at, which is what is the cost of the problems that we need to solve? Almost always problems cost money, right? In a hospital, having patients uh, stay longer because their diagnosis is not going well is costing the patient money, it's costing the hospital money, it's creating all sorts of problems, right? So who, where, does that, where does that problem happen? So let's look at that. And so we call these problem value metrics. And these are the things we're gonna talk about next week, which is uh, um, uh, uh, what are the success metrics? What are the progress metrics? What are the problem value metrics that help us tell that we are getting to our outcome? Perfect. So that's gonna be uh, next week, it's free. You can come, bring your friends, bring your family. Makes a great gift. Uh, uh, I'll be can there. Find it. Yeah, you can find it at leaders.centercenter.com. Uh, I'm tweeting it all week, so just look at my Twitter feed. You'll find links I, to it. I also add the link on, on the chat here. So guys, oh, good. Okay. make sure you go there. Uh, I'm going to be there as well. It will be really, really cool. And um, that's, that's connecting with something that I love when you talk about... Uh, we talk uh, the, the, the agenda amplifiers metric, right? It's something on, on your drawing. Uh, uh, you didn't talk a lot about it. When we're talking about dashboards, it, it, it resonates a little bit about that. But could you talk a little bit about the agenda amplifiers metrics? I'm sorry, the agenda... The, the, the... the agenda amplifiers. Oh, agenda amplifiers. Yes, I got it. Sorry, uh, that's my uh, accent. Um, <laughs> agenda amplifiers... Uh, are, um, <laughs> the, how do you explain them to people? Uh, th they are a, um, uh, when, what people do is they'll put up a chart and they'll, the chart will be, you know, some something that comes out of Google Analytics. And, you know, maybe it's time on page or bounce rate or some other metric. And they'll put up the chart and they'll say, look at this chart. That number's too high. We need to fix it. I need the money to do the budget. And that's how they, they, they take their agenda and they say, this chart. And so basically what they're doing is they're going through all the different reports that their tools have. And they just look for the ones that best support their case. And they put those on the wall and they say to the executives, look at this, this is awful. We need to lower this number or we need to raise this number. It actually doesn't matter, but whatever it is, we need to do one of those things and you need to give me money to do that and staff and, and resources. And anytime someone does that, it's, a, it's an agenda amplifier. And that's, that's how people use a lot of metrics is they, they just go shopping for the metrics that tell the story they want. Instead, we take a different approach. We don't do that. We start with the outcome and we say, okay, we're going to have to do some research to understand what the current situation is and why people are unhappy with our product. And then we figure out what the improvement is. So now we've got this, these stories that tell us that, hey, right now our customers don't like us very much, but if we gave them this improvement, we, they would love us. So now we have that story to tell and we can talk about how many customers are there and, and how much of an improvement it needs to be. And then we can sort of look at that and say, okay, well, this is our outcome. So now that this is our outcome, what, uh, uh, what problems are preventing that outcome from happening today? And that's where the problem value metrics come in. And we can say, look, people keep calling support because they're unhappy and every time they call support, that costs our organization millions of dollars. So if we can reduce the number of support calls, we save millions of dollars here and we make someone's life better, including the support people's life better. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, that's the place we're going to do. So now let's come up with some solutions that solve the problems that then deliver the improvement. And we use the metrics to support that story and not just some sort of game of, let's see if I can put up charts that tell a better story than the charts you tell. Amazing, amazing. 
Uh, there's there's something really interesting when, when we're talking about metrics. That is um, the KPIs, right? That is that uh, there is a, a misunderstanding around the KPIs, um, and everything gets to be a KPI. And what we don't see on the KPIs is actually what is important for the users. We see like uh, conversion rate. We see like churn. Yeah. I mean. That's is a problem of starting with internal business facing metrics. We need to start with external facing metrics, right? We need, if we're producing software that doctors use in a hospital, what will improve the lives of their patients? What will improve the lives of the families of their patients? What will improve the lives of the doctors? What will improve the lives of the families of the doctors, right? If we can talk to those things, then then we can figure out, well, how does conversion fit into that? Is conversion even a thing when we're talking about doctors? No. Okay. Well, then let's talk about what's important with doctors and, and the families and the patients and all those things. So we need to understand whose life we're trying to improve. And, and when we start with the business me metrics um, uh, and we just say, well, we want conversions to go up by 12% by the end of the year. Okay, I, I can do that. I can even do that in a way that, you know, here, here's the thing about conversions, right? Conversions, they're, they're a joke. Um, uh, because a conversion a conversion is uh, the number of uh, purchasers or act, you know, if you're, if it's a call to action, the number of people who take the call to action over the number of visitors. So let's say I have 10,000 purchasers and I have a million visitors, right? That's, that's a 1% conversion rate. So let's say I want to go to a 2% conversion rate. Well, there's actually two ways I can do that. I can get 20,000 uh, over a million. Or easier, much easier, is to just get 10,000 over 500,000. Right? Yeah. This is easier. All I have to do is slash my marketing budget, get less visitors, and my conversion rate doubles. Exactly. <laughs> okay. I don't make any more money. I'm not making anybody's life happier, but I am definitely rocking that conversion rate. <laughs> so, so, you know, conversion rate's a joke. Uh, anybody's measuring their business based on conversion rate, it's there purely to game the system. It, let's talk about improvements. <laughs> Pretty amazing, uh, and and that's awesome because I think tomorrow uh, this 120 people that are, are here in the, the in the in the in the live will will go like, oh my god, at their company, we are doing our OKRs wrong. We are doing our I don't know what system or framework you are you are using wrong, and uh, this will be really really interesting. Throw the dashboard well, yeah, away. I mean, okay, OKRs are a great example because yeah. for an OKR, the objective part can be the success metric. Exactly. Right? So how am I improving someone's life? How will I tell? That's the objective. And then the progress metrics or the problem value metrics, those can be the key results. Yeah. Right? So nobody ever explains it this way. This turns out to be the, the, the easiest way to, to think about it. And you can get everybody on the same page pretty quick. Fully agree. Fully agree. And what is something awesome is uh, when you when you draw the the line between uh, frustrating until delightful, and you have the the, the product value, uh, the, the the metric that measures the product value and how much you you're, you're spending to get to it. Sometimes you're saying invisible is good. We don't have to delight every time, right? Sometimes it's invisible or, or, or it's just it's just fine. Exactly. Cool. Awesome. So. I'm gonna take a few more questions of the chat here because oh, this is crazy, insane, really good. Um, sorry, you, you're gonna say something, Jared? Let's do it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, 
Oh, that's a good one. Guilherme Dias Pereira is asking, Jared, could you please elaborate on what are the traps we should avoid so that we don't create a UX strategy that is something different from a holistic product strategy? What are the trends you should avoid? Or the traps we should traps. avoid? Traps we should avoid so that we so that we create a holistic UX strategy. Um, I mean, the, the, the big trap is to somehow cut the, the people whose lives we're trying to improve out of the equation, right? That's the trap that everybody falls into. It, and it's easy trap to fall into because you spend all of your time thinking about your business. Oh my God, we have to get something out this month. We have to, we have to make our sales numbers. We have to, you know, get people to subscribe. We have to make sure people don't unsubscribe. You know, we, we, we're focused on all these things and we stop asking the question, but how is doing those things helping someone improve their life? And I'm, so we, so the trap is to, to forget about that, right? To, to, to get lost in that equation. Um, uh, you look at a company that has sort of lost its way and, uh, you know, there's some that might say that Apple's lost its way, that, that, you know, the days of Steve Jobs, when the first iPad came out and the first watch came out, they were onto something, but these days, you know, the products are just more features, but they're not really incredible improvements. Right. So, so that's the, that's the, that's what's happened, right? They're not thinking about how are we improving someone's life? They're thinking about, well, we've got a keynote coming up and in the keynote, we have to explain what's going to be shipped. And, you know, we've got, we've got to get something ready to show people. If we don't have something ready to show people, uh, there won't be a, there, we won't be able to do that. So, so, and that's the problem, right? Is that they, they, they lose their way. You know, we can debate whether Apple's lost its way or not, but the fact remains that their their new product announcements don't wow people like they used to. And you know, less and less times people are waking up at four in the morning to go stand out in front of the Apple store to get the the product on the first day, right? So how do you do that? Well, it has to be something that's going to improve someone's life. It has to be something remarkable and. The reality is for a company like Apple, that gets exponentially harder with every new thing, right? When, you know, if we go back to my, my, my awful drawings here, um, when you're down here and everything in the world is really frustrating, making things better, I mean, that's like going from one to two. When we go from one to two, that's a hundred percent improvement. Yeah. We only went up by one, but it's a hundred percent improvement over what we had. When I go to from two to three, I'm still only going up by one, but unfortunately now it's, it's a 50% improvement. Yeah. And when I go from three to four, I'm still only going up by one. I'm doing the same thing that got me the hundred percent improvement here, but now it's only a 30% improvement. And, and that, percentage of improvement keeps going down. If I want to get a hundred percent improvement, I have to go one, two, four, eight, right? And that's way harder. Yeah. That's far more difficult. And that puts huge demands on the innovation team and the organization and all the folks who are, who are working to, to, to do that. And that's Apple's problem, right? Yeah. Is that, is that to go, they're, they're now, you know, trying to get from 16,000 to 32,000, whereas before they were just going from one to two. And it's that, that 32,000, you have to travel the distance you've done from the very beginning to get the next increment. Yeah. And that's really hard to keep getting that, that improvement. And so this is, this is the problem we have is that we, we turn inwards and we focus on well, how do we get more subscribers? How do we get more people to stay subscribers? And not, how do we deliver better value? Something that improves people's lives.
pretty dense and amazing thoughts. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a question from uh, uh, Chewy uh, Rafael Montenegro. Um, he's he's asking a question for Jared. How to balance research and execution on your strategy to get biggest amount of results and learning also? How to balance research? I'm sorry. How to balance research and and as execution on your strategy to get the biggest amount of results and learning also and also learning. Got it. Um, uh, well, execution is research. And research is execution. So, so one thing to, to, to is that is that as long as we keep separating those two things out, we will always find them in tension with each other. Right? You can't execute if you're not learning, and you can't learn if you're not doing research. Right? If I execute something, but I never find out whether what I just produced was any good, I won't actually, I'm not finished. I'm not done executing. And I won't be able to continue to execute at all, really. Right? It's, it's, it's like the chef in the kitchen who's just cooking things and sending the food out, but doesn't know whether anybody eats it or if there's even anybody in the restaurant. Yeah. And uh, that's part of the problem is, is, is you have to be paying attention. If you watch chefs in kitchens, they pay really close attention to the what's feedback. coming back on people's plates. When the 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 folks bring in the, the the dirty plates to go to the dishwasher, they're looking and they're seeing is there food that's sitting on that plate that someone hardly touched? And does that keep happening? Right? Do they have a, a dish of potatoes that nobody's eating? And every time they send it out, it comes back and people have hardly eaten it, right? That's part of execution. If you think that that's somehow separate from execution, you will fail. That that's somebody else's job, that that's somebody else's thing, that we have to schedule it in, that we have to budget for it separately, that we have to get the client to pay for it separately. You will fail, right? The only way you can succeed is if you see them as one and the same. And, and that's the key piece there. And then the question is, how do you optimize your time so that you have as much information coming in while you're trying to get as much stuff out? Awesome. That's, and, and that's really amazing because it connects directly with something you, you I, I, an article that you wrote, uh, uh, I think a few years ago, uh, talking about increasing the exposure of uh, of the team to real customers, so they yep. actually can see the dishes coming out, coming in, and understand what what did they eat, what did they didn't eat, and and learning from that and putting that yep. on the sprint or on their whatever they are using as a cycle to work. Yeah, I mean the the the, the kitchen staff should be out with the folks watching them eat their meals. They should be paying attention. Um, and, uh, one of the things that, that, uh, that chefs will tell you is that, is that they actually sometimes prefer what are called open kitchens where you, the kitchen can see into the restaurant and the restaurant can see the kitchen. Uh, uh, and, and they like that because they can actually see what's happening out in the, in the space. And they're more connected with their customers. It's not like we're in a room by ourselves as if they're, you know, whether if there are customers there or not, we have no idea. All we see is, you know, the computer puts out an order and we fill the order and we send it out the door and we never, we don't know anything about what happens next. We're just shipping stuff. We're just shipping stuff. Pretty amazing. Jared, uh, I'm really happy. We, we, we reached the one hour barrier. I know that on your live streams, you, you usually do, do 30 minutes and you've been almost there, right? Recently, 29, 31. So today yeah. we double that. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. It's okay. And we still have tons of questions uh, here. Um, um, we, we have several questions that, questions that you already answered uh, during your talk. 
Um, but I, 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 I think uh, is, it is okay for you if... We, but if here's we, what you can do. Go ahead. Put the questions. Have people go to the leaders of awesomeness community. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. And have them put their questions there. And I will answer their questions. Awesome. So, everyone, uh, that's, uh, I think, a good call to action to, to talk uh, and, and to invite you first to, to go on the Leaders of Awesomeness. Uh, I'm going to throw the link here for you so that will be easier. Uh, and before going, think on subscribing to this channel because next week we're going to have Aoluca and then we're going to have Fabio Sasso, the Abduzido for the Brazilians that are working with design for, for, for a while. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have awesome, awesome participants here. And Jared is one of the amazing people that are being here. And uh, there's more to come. But please show some love and please uh, go, go, go ahead and, and subscribe to the leaders uh, of Awesomeness, the, the, the community that Jared is uh, it's creating. And uh, I've been there for the past two months, I think, and it is awesome. Uh, next week, they will have some... some uh, uh, some some five days uh, and on how to work on persuasive UX metrics, right, Jared? If I'm not mistaken, and I, I'm I'm yeah I'm, yeah five day intensive, absolutely free. It's a it's an online, it's sort of a workshop, sort of a a, a working thing. You actually will create your own metrics that you can put to work right away, and uh, so bring your team so they can work with you to, on this. There'll be homework every day. Um, uh, and by the end of the week, you'll have this 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 uh, plan on how to move forward, an action plan on how to move forward with your metrics, so that you're measuring things that not just are measuring the right things, but they're they're, they're metrics you can use to sell the value of UX in your organization because people are going to say, oh yeah, that's exactly the outcome we need. That's what we want. And and when when the metrics we have are persuasive. People get behind them and they use their agendas to support them. And suddenly it becomes a priority in the organization. Perfect. Perfect. Do, do you mind closing up with a joke, a dad joke? Because, I mean, I, that's the only thing that's missing. We have your drawings. We, we have your thoughts. We have a few kind of, of, of acid jokes that we have. But the dad jokes are the most recently one. And I think I, I, we couldn't close this without one. A joke. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, it's it's so funny. It's 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 something uh, to do on demand is is actually really hard. Uh, I'm trying to think of a joke uh, that that I can tell to people that'll be on YouTube forever. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah. if you don't want to do that don't worry you don't have to commit to that <laughs> what would be a good joke um uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm stumped <laughs> don't worry don't worry because no worries. Worries. No my family will tell you that 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 uh uh that one of my specialties is coming up with a joke at an inopportune time um, but but it's it's usually not something that's that's desired. Of course, I'll think of one the minute we hang up. No worries. Then you can send me on LinkedIn, and I'm gonna share with everybody. <laughs> there you go. So thank you so much, Jared. I I love you even more right now. I already loved you a bunch, and now I mean I'm I, I'm and not just me. Everybody in the chat, they are. Oh my God, he's awesome, and it, it is true. <laughs> so. Yeah, guys, uh, for you that are, that are seeing this video, I would like you to double up the, 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 um, the subscriptions on, the, on Jared's community and also on this channel so you can stay tuned for the next things. Jared, any, any final words that you would like to say to us? Uh, wash your hands, wear your mask, stay six feet apart, be safe. Uh, this thing's not over yet. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jared. Bye Thank guys, you for encouraging my behavior, Tiago. <laughs>